Well, I'm going to show you how many things have evolved. This is really a story of how we got from this to this. Give the one of the lights a little more no, in the house, please. From this to this. Early humans evolved from a common ape-like ancestor six or seven million years ago. Humans did not evolve from monkeys or apes. Humans share a common ancestor with modern African apes. Seven million years ago, the species divided into two separate lineages. Gorillas slash chimps and then early human ancestors called hominids. Today we'll be discussing those hominids. The second dot from the top, Artificus ramidus, or Artie, who lived 4 million, 400,000 years ago. The fourth dot from the top, Australopithecus africanus, or Lucy, that lived 3 million, 200,000 years ago. Homo habilis, or Handyman, that lived 2 and a half million years ago. Homo erectus, or an upright man that lived two million years ago, and a couple lived a couple hundred thousand years ago, and that's us Homo sapiens. These hominid remains are generally found in the African Rift Valley in the northeast part of Ethiopia. There the remains of Artificus, Arti, Australopithecus, Lucy, and the Homo species are found. Though some other hominid fossils are found in neighboring Chad, Kenya, and Tanzania. This is the current Ethiopian, land, Ethiopian landscape that these remains are found in a dry, desolate, barren place where the remote remains are found at or near the surface. This is much like the Badlands in South Dakota. The science we're discussing today is called paleoanthropology mixed in with cultural anthropology. However, four to five million years ago, this was a vast forest covering thousands of square miles and where our first species already lived. Now we'll be covering our family trees, speaking of trees, Oops, wrong kind of family tree. <laughs> but will mainly look like this. The Artificines are already at the bottom. The Australopithecines, like Lucy, to the right. And then Havis, Erectus, Neanderthal, and Sapien. The direction of these hominids was away from chimps. There's no missing link species here, and there's no straight line chain of events to modern man. There's been at least 15 to 18 of these hominid type species of these humanoid creatures Many were relatives, but not human ancestors. They did not lead to modern man. However, today we will be discussing these hominids and highlighting them in a logical progression. The first of significance was Artificus ramidus. They lived between they lived four million four hundred thousand years ago. And in the early nineties, a partial skeleton was found of a female from this species, and they called her Artie, and she represents these species in entirety. Artie was four feet tall, weighed 110 pounds, and her brain size was this, 325, 325 cubic centimeters, about 11 ounces. So Artie had a broad focus for walking upright. Artie was first to walk on two legs, and walking upright is one of the hallmarks of being called a hominid. The arms and legs were long but of equal length. Artie had hip muscles on the side of her body to maintain balance. Artie was a biped on the ground, but a quadruped in trees, using all four limbs on tree branches and using palms to move along them. She had a stiff outer foot, more like ours and apes, and had a big toe to climb trees, but other toes were flat and stiff for walking. Artie ate fruits and, nuts, fruits and nuts, and her canine teeth, shown below, were equal in size between male and female. We can compare Artie's canines to that of a baboon. And having smaller canines is another hallmark of being called a hominid because this reduced tensions between the sexes. Artie's skull sat atop the vertebrae column, not in front like a chimp, making her more upright. The skull was forward placed. Artie was a transitional fossil between ape-like ancestor and bipedal humans, neither chimp nor human. As a result of being bipedal, they could forage for food easier and quicker this way. However, it was harder for the females to walk because they were generally carrying babies. So with the excess food the males brought back, they traded this with the females for sex. So bipedalism was a result of our two most basic instincts, eating and sex. This species became extinct and another species took its place, the Australopithecines. And in the 70s, a specimen was found 
47 mound clones were found of a female from the species. They called her Lucy, and she represents the entire species. Lucy was about three and a half feet tall, which is this tall, and weighed between 60 and 100 pounds. And this was her brain size, or 450 cubic centimeters, about 15 ounces, about the size of a chin. And Lucy was, uh, and this was her brain size, the specimen that Lucy discovered was young and fully mature when she died because she had wisdom teeth. Scientists think Lucy was between 18 and 25 years old and had a child. And since they didn't live long in those days, think about this, your daughter having a baby at 12 and you die in natural causes at age 25. Lucy died from falling out of a tree. I guess she couldn't make up her mind between walking and tree climbing. Lucy was bipedal and had arched feet, giving up the ability to use a big toe for grasping branches. She had longer arms and legs, but with an intermediate ratio between human and ape. The angle of the femur in relation to her knee joint surfaces shows she's able to walk. So Lucy had a large belly shown to the right here and a large rib cage, or a broad pelvis. Lucy had a cone-shaped rib cage for room for a bigger stomach. Thus she had a low bulk, excuse me, a low quality, high bulk diet like apes do. Then she was able to roam the countryside and forage for food such as fruits, nuts, seeds, and bird's eggs. Walking in strong jaws made her able to live both in wooded areas and open areas. Her brain neocortex was expanded, compromising her visual acuity, which means that there was an evolutionary trade off here between a larger brain and less and other senses. This trade off is why, us humans, we have less superior eyesight sense of smell and hearing compared to other animals. So Lucy had a larger brain, smaller teeth, longer arms, with hands and shoulders adapted to climbing trees. She had both human-like and ape-like features. She was a transitional species. Please note that it took millions of years and thousands of generations for us to become humans. And that really, even mutations took a long time to kick in. And just as the limestone bedrock underneath this foundation, underneath the building that the foundation of this building rests upon took millions of years to form, we took millions of years to evolve. And we are still evolving today. All evolution means is change over time. And if you're not changing over time, it means you're dead. So bipedalism, bigger brains, smaller canines, with arms that were shorter than legs were the benchmarks of what it is to be human. And there is a ratio in us with our arms to our legs. The humerus, the bone that runs between the shoulder to the elbow, needs to be 30% shorter than the femur, the bone that runs between the hip to the knee. That is, there needs to be a ratio of 7 in the humerus to 10 in the femur. Therefore, if the humerus is 14 inches long, the femur needs to be 18 inches long. However, in Gibbons, gorillas, and apes to the left here, well, they have 10 to 10 ratios. Already had a 9.9 ratio to 10 ratio, excuse me, 9.9 to 10 ratio. Lucy had a 8.4 to 10 ratio, and of course ours is 7 to 10. Now there's an application that you can use on your smartphone to determine your own personal arm and leg proportions, and it's called, there's an ape for that. <laughs> we have a curved spine, and walk by feet only. Excuse me, we have a curved spine and arched feet. This helps absorb the shock of walking. Lucy had a curved spine and S-shaped spine, and we know she walked upright and walked by feet only with arched feet because her 67 footprints were found fossilized in volcanic ash that date to her species time period. <coughs> Hominids developed by feetalism as a strategy for living on the ground when climate change decimated the forest that left open terrain and no trees. Hominids that were good bipedal walkers had an advantage here. When environmental factors caused woodlands to shrink, this left wide belts of open terrain called savannas. And there's a reason why gorillas and apes do not walk through savannas. If they were to do so, they walk through it slowly and therefore made easy target for predators. However, oh, walking on 75, excuse me, walking on four legs takes 75% more energy than walking on two. However, if you walk through this bipedally, you'll be able to walk through this faster, see further ahead, 
and when you're out and about with a group of others, you can safely get through this while foraging for food. There's also a difference in locomotion between us and a chimp. We have muscles in the arch of our feet to spring us forward. Calf muscles, quadriceps, and buttocks muscles for stability. Plus, as the, uh, we have back muscles like the trapezius, excuse me, trapezius, and the tissimus dorsi for stability. Plus, as the insect shows here, we have a more developed inner ear than the chimp. And this is for balance. Because when we walk, all of our weight is on one leg for a brief millisecond. And everyone here knows someone who's had balance issues. Also, bipedalism has advantages. With having two hands free, you could carry free, you could have carry stone tools, you could carry sticks to fashion into weapons, carry sticks to knock down food, forge the food easier, carry babies, ward off other animals, see further ahead, and when you're out and about with a group of others, you can use your hands then to make gestures, which will be an important part of our brain development that we'll talk about later on. And we all can relate to gestures in the modern day world. After all, they're used quite frequently in roundabouts. <laughs> so, now this was a hard scramble life for these hominids, as it, they are exceptionally fortunate to be able to live to age 25, as there are no remains found, found of older folks. And whatever childhood illness or maladies you had growing up, well, they would die from that. They also died early in life from childbirth, malnutrition, exposure, dehydration, starvation, and infections. We talked about eating the seed. Well, if you bit down too hard on the seed, you could crack a back molar. These people didn't have dentists or, or brush their teeth, and therefore you could die from an infection because of that. Hmm. <laughs> the next species we talked about is Homo habilis. He was discovered by Mary and Richard Leakey back in the late 50s and early 60s. Many of us grew up watching the Leakey's exploits on National Geographic specials when we were younger on TV back in the day. Havilus uh, lived between 2,300,000 years back and died out as a species 1,700,000 years, which means he lived for 600,000 years as a species. Now, Havilus was uh, between 3.5 to 4.5 feet tall and had a short build and long arms. Now, he is a rather controversial figure in anthropology today because of the fact that we're not clear who his ancestors were. We think they were the osteopaths, like Lucy, but we're not quite certain because the fossil record is spotty and incomplete going back two and three million years. However, the reason why Havilus is highlighted here today is because of his cranial capacity. That is, over time, it increased up to 650 cubic centimeters, or this much in total, which is one and a half pounds of brain, which is half the size of our brain. With this increase in cranial capacity, there is an expansion in the frontal lobe, where critical thinking and planning occur. There is also an expansion in the bronchus area, where there's speech production, although they didn't use words as we know it. So with their opposable thumbs and increased intelligence, they took tool making to the next level. Whereas their probable ancestors, the osteopaths, just took large rocks and slammed them down on things, Havis would take stones and chip at them together. And that, when they did that, they used hammer stones then to make sharp edges on these rocks to use as cutting tools. They would then take these stone cutting tools with them when they foraged for food, and when they ran across carcasses of dead animals, they would cut the meat out of them since they were scavengers. And hundreds of these stone tools and stone flakes were found by their remains, which is why they are called candy man or skilled man because of their use and dexterity in making these kind of tools. Now, Havilus is generally put in the homo species by anthropologists for a number of reasons, and that is because they had precursors that led toward modern man. These precursors that Havilus had included smaller canines, they walked bipedally, they had increased cranial capacity, and used more sophisticated tools than their ancestors. However, some anthropologists disagree and think that they should be in a genus all by themselves, and this is what makes Havilus controversial because their arm and leg proportions were eight to 10. However, most anthropologists put them in the homo species because of these precursor tendencies. Now, Havilus had a larger belly like the osteopus, but more of a human face and smaller teeth. The smaller teeth meant they were omnivores. We are omnivores. 
which means they had a diet that is varied and had a lot of options to it. Why they survived 600,000 years as a species because over time they were more generalists than specialists. So for the first four million years, our ancestors had arm and leg proportions that were ape-like, they had smaller canines, they walked bipedally, and had increased cranial capacity. Well, about that cranial capacity, the chimp's brain here is a smaller one, it's 15 ounces. Ours is 48 ounces or three pounds. Brains in adults increased in size as hominid species progressed through time. Chimp at the bottom, we'll see up next, habits that we just discussed. Erectus that we will discuss, Neanderthal and Sapien. Brains over time got bigger with more folds. More folds equal more surface area for thinking, and the frontal lobe especially increased over time to help us in the areas of problem solving, critical thinking, planning, language skills, sense of empathy, and self-awareness, all aspects of modern thinking. And as hominids, for, um, as, as hominids lost the need for bigger intestines, like in age or even earlier hominids, the surplus energy went to the brain. Our brain is 2% of our body mass, yet needs 20% of our body energy to run. Now most of us here have 2,500 calorie diets per day, while 500 calories a day goes to running the brain. And brains got bigger over time for a number of reasons. First, a larger, more complex brain did better at social interaction and unfamiliar habitats and terrain. Without language, one had to interpret meaning through body language and gestures. In ancient social groups, gestures were made so that tasks could be performed so all could survive. Someone, through the use of gestures, had to ward off predators. Someone needed to find water. Someone needed to find shelter for the night. Someone needed to watch young children. There needed to be a group leader. And in order to catch and kill a rabbit, for instance, you would need a group effort using these kind of gestures to accomplish your task. So, imagine living your whole life without ever speaking words to anyone and people not speaking words to you. You would have to use that in a very complicated and complex game of charades and sound effects to be able to get what you need, to get along with others, and to survive. This would be doubly hard trying to find a mate as your biological clock starts ticking at 12 and literally could expire in a few years. So we can empathize with these hominid characters as well as increase our own brain power by using these kind of charades in your own home with your spouse. Since we all live here in the villages, you can use these kind of charades. This would mean, that's right, you want to play golf. Well, if you want to go to the square tonight and enjoy a lively entertainment with your spouse, and dance the night away, you would do something like this. <laughs> Everybody here knows what that means. But things get really weird when you use these gestures to indicate to your spouse that your neighbor is going in for a colonoscopy. <laughs> and doubly weird when you use these gestures to indicate to your spouse that you have to take care of the neighbor's dog who has incontinence problems. <laughs> So through social action alone, our brain became more developed. It's also considered that eating meat, excuse me, that eating protein like meat also helped develop the brain. Protein, fats, and amino acids in meat were essential in stimulating brain growth. Cooked meat was easy to digest, and a smaller digestive tract made it easier to digest food. However, with a plant-based diet, it would mean you would constantly have to gather grubs for about eight hours a day, really a full-time job every day of your life, just to be able to maintain vitality. Eating meat saves time from always gathering. And you can validate this yourself in the villages this so by trying this social experiment. Have an eight-ounce salad, and then do one of the many sports in the villages for a few hours. The next day, have an eight-ounce steak, and then do one of the many sports here in the villages for a number of hours. Which meal leaves you with the most vitality and energy? Of course, it's the meat-based one because protein always carries the most punch. However, eating meat had some cost to it. That is, killing and, and eating a wild animal, you might get parasites from it like tapeworms. You might get trichinosis. Also, hunting and killing wild animals is an exceptionally dangerous thing to do, and you need a cooperative effort with others who have knowledge and experience. Also, meat does not keep well or long in an equatorial environment. You have to hunt often. 
Even produce, like fruits and vegetables, were different back in the day. This is what a banana looked like a while back. White carrots were the size of your little finger compared to what they are now. Peaches, well, you can put 10 of them in your hand 6,000 years ago compared to what they are now. Corn was the size of your index finger and middle finger compared to what it is nowadays. It is through the advent of genetic engineering that we have produce that can feed the world. Plus, if you had a stone tool like Cavalus did with sharp edges on it, you could use this to fashion sticks into sophisticated, effective, effective weapons. You can make an into huts with it, and you can also use this then to break open animal bones that have marrow in them that are high in fat and calcium. And nowadays, it seems everyone has their own ideas about diet and evolution. <laughs> Now, all this bone breaking and hunting worked out the sweat. And hominids were first to regulate their temperatures through sweating. Sweating helps maintain safe body and brain temperatures. Of course, the elimination of most body hair made sweating possible. More sweat glands and less hair meant more perspiration could evaporate from the body and cool the body. A tall, linear physique also created a large surface area so the body could cool itself off even easier. Sweating thus enabled early hominids to be active during daytime hours and perform arduous tasks like hunting. And with sweating, you could perform persistence hunting and be able to catch the world's fastest land animal, the cheetah. You could do this by keeping the cheetah in sight and keep running after it. Sooner or later, the cheetah will have to slow down and stop because animals with body hair cannot regulate their own temperatures. They can only pant. And since body hair on animals negates cooling, you can come up right up to the cheetah and kill it. And as discussed, we have the muscles to run. We have a long Achilles tendon that helps with that. And we are born to run. We are one of the few species on this planet that can run 9 to 12 miles per hour for 2 or 3 hours straight and get away with it. And even another way to cool the body, plus protecting against the sun's damaging UV rays, was to develop skin that was permanently black. Melanin is our skin's natural brown pigment and natural sunscreen and became an important factor for hominids who live near the equator. Since UV rays help strip away folic acid, essential for healthy fetuses, melanin protects us from this. However, as hominids moved away from equatorial regions, they needed less melanin, their skin became lighter. And therefore, the lighter skin then helps UV rays that better penetrate the skin and in more northern latitudes promote more vitamin D in the body. This is why we have different skin color variations in the world because of our original proximity to the equator. Why even our hair evolved over time, people in equatorial regions have hair that is curly, kinky, and dry. This allows heat to escape from the head. However, people in more northern latitudes have straight hair that's a touch oily. This then insulates the head, the neck, and the shoulders because there's an 8% heat loss from the head alone. And as we did talk about, in sweating, have, have a, a taller and linear body that helps out with sweating, well, over time, we did get linear and taller. And we did talk about the Lucy species that has a wide pelvis and wide rib cage. Well, 2 million years ago, our hips grew smaller to allow early humans to walk long distances. Long legs make early hominids walk faster and further as environment change. And I'm going to pick on those words as environment change because that sounds so pedantic, overly scholarly, and typical of a science lecture. Environments do change over time. That is, forests over time can become grasslands. Grasslands over a few thousand years can become wetlands. We see these three different environments when we travel around here through central Florida. Now, if you're a hominid back in the day of living and traveling through those environments, or living in them, they have to adapt to those changes because each environment has different plants to consume and different plants to avoid that are poisonous, with different animals to hunt, with different hunting techniques, and different kind of habit, uh, excuse me, shelters to live in. Getting back to linear and taller body. In order to increase the energy efficiency of walking upright, the lower part of our ribcage had to narrow. The upper ribcage expanded giving us larger lungs and more of a barrel shape. However, the narrowing of the pelvis constricted the female birth canal, and a tight pelvis would have caused birthing problems. 
as brains increase in size over time, molar center push, increasingly big brain infants through an already tight pelvis. So there had to be an evolutionary compromise between brain size and pelvis size so the babies could be pushed out. Clearly, too big of a brain or head, and the baby has a hard time being pushed out. This puts the mother and baby in serious jeopardy, and this is not evolutionary advantageous. However, coming out too small, too immature is, is not advantageous either. So nature sided on the end of caution with us, and we really have a relatively immature brain when we are born. It really takes about the age of 20 for our brain to fully develop, especially the frontal cortex, where critical thinking occurs. And this is why we have so many problems with teenagers and politicians. <laughs> so this immaturity makes our babies helpless. And the mother needs to be well nourished for an extended period of time uh, to be able to take care of the baby. This makes the mothers more reliant on their male partners, which then promotes faithfulness in a strong bonding family. This was the start of the nuclear family. So advantages were found in the way we changed over time with our arm and leg proportions, with our muscles, with our, our skin color, with the way we sweat, with our hair, with our pelvis, and with our brain, and all this changed to become homo erectus, or upright man that lived 1,900,000 years ago and died out only between 100 and 200,000 years back. Homo erectus had an amazing amount of brain capacity. It got up to this much, 1,200 cubic centimeters, or 85% the size of our brain. And he was one of the first human ancestors to have similar limb and torso proportions to us. He was five and six feet tall and had five and six feet tall and weighed between 80 and 150 pounds. He was clearly linear and taller. Physical traits included human-like body proportions. They lived on the ground. They had lost tree climbing adaptations and had elongated legs. Over time, they were able to plan, problem solve, and use tools. We know this from the strength and dexterity of their hands. Erectus was first to harness fire. The oldest hearts are one million years old, and we know fully well they were using fire thousands of years, if not tens of thousands of years before that. Over time, Erectus made animal skin clothing, wooden bowls, and they used stone tools. One of their famous stone tools they made was the Ashleyan hand axe. It really was an all-purpose useful tool much like the equivalent of a Stone Age version of a Swiss Army knife. It was able to cut, pound, chop, dig, scrape, all the things you needed to do back then. And with their stone tools, Erectus then was able to make huts. And they're also famous for making these long huts called windbreakers that are up to 50 feet long that help them from dying from exposure, a common problem back then. Erectus really started out as gatherers and quickly, almost 170,000 years ago, began using their stone tool technology to hunt animals, kill them, and butcher their prey. They had uh, more of a setback forehead than we did in their prominent brow ridge. The brow ridge is an uh, extension from the Simian past, and it really is a buttress that helps out in the act of chewing large amounts of plants that our ape-like ancestors had. This species survived nine times longer than we have as a species, and we're not clear if their frontal lobe was big enough for speech development. It's a matter of contentious debate. The species is a direct human ancestor to us, and with all the adaptations we've talked about today, and particularly with the legs and the brain, they were the first to leave Africa. This is all tied into the out of Africa theory or the single origin hypothesis. Erectus was able to leave Africa about 1,800,000 years ago and went into the Middle East first, not into Europe. And this needs to be explained. Erectus left Africa in many, many ways in tribes of about 20 or 50, not mass migrations of today. And in order to get out of Africa, they had to get out, they had to go through the Sahara. Sahara is as big as the United States. However, Back in those days, the Sahara experienced climate change and was more of a cooler, wetter place, just like the savanna that we talked about. Erectus then was able to hunt animals that are now extinct on that savanna type environment. They then went into the Middle East in waves and in groups and started colonizing in scattered and sporadic areas in the Middle East first. 
They then went eastbound from that into Eurasia and into the Indian subcontinent, where in scattered, again, in sporadic areas, not densely populated areas like ours, they were then able to go into Southeast Asia and into Indonesia, down south. And there's a famous fossil called Java Man, which is really an Indonesian Homo erectus in Indonesia back 800,000 years ago. Erectus then went through a Western, Western Asia and into Central Asia, where another famous fossil was found, it's called Peking Man, which is really Homo erectus in Central Asia back about 700,000 years ago. So this was the range that Erectus had. It took about 800,000 years in the dark green. And another species left Africa about 600,000 years ago called Homo hydrovirginus. And Homo hydrovirginus left Africa, went north, and went into northern Europe where <laughs> they would become the Neanderthals that we'll talk about in a bit. So this was a range of Homo erectus who left Africa in waves for hundreds of thousands of years and colonized the Middle East, Eurasia, and Asian areas. And this is really one of the greatest stories ever told of how we colonized the world and really de deserves a lecture in and of itself. Over time, Erectus would be replaced by Homo sapiens, which is us. Erectus would die out about 150,000 years, and we came on the scene between 200 and 300,000 years. And we had our own ideas about colonizing, and there were some waves that happened with us around uh, the first wave about 130 years ago, 130,000 years ago, where we left Africa, went through the Sahara, which was a savanna type environment, and went into the Middle East and went into the Levant section, which is where the Jordan River runs through Jordan, uh, Israel, and Syria, and then they colonized parts of the Iran, parts of the Iran, Iraq, and Turkey areas. They colonized this for about tens of thousands of years, but this was known as a failed dispersal because it did not colonize any areas to the east or west other than the Middle East and Eurasian areas. And then once again, there is a large mass migration wave about between 55 and 65,000 years back. And this is the one that colonized the world. At that time, there was a global ice age. This took a lot of the moisture out of the air. Sahara then became the desert that it is today and expanded and the animals flood, and we flood with them because we chase the animals. Our population as Homo sapiens dropped down between 10,000 and 2,000, we became an endangered species. And the sea levels also dropped by hundreds of feet. And we were able to leave the Africa again in groups of tribes and sporadic times in a more southern route because we couldn't go through the Sahara. We left out where Asia, where Africa meets Arabia at the gates of Greece. And there we took, it's only about a seven mile difference, we took rafts, and from there we started colonizing the world, about 55,000 years back or more. And again, we started in the Middle East at that time and went further east into Eurasia, went into the Indian subcontinent, going eastbound, going into Southeast Asia, and this time we got further than Indonesia and went to Australia. We got to Australia by island hopping, because the sea levels were lower, and by using rafts. There, that's how we became, that's how the Aborigines started. There was also a push then into Asia, into Central Asia, and into Eastern Asia, into Northern Asia, and into Siberia, where we followed the coastline, because the interior was too cold and too snowy then. So we followed the coastline and went into the Bering a land bridge that is now open school with a connection between Asia and North America. We then followed the coastline south using rafts down into North America, where the place where there is no more snow and ice, which is in the southwest part of North America. This is where the Clovis culture started, which turned into the Southwest Indian tribes. There is then a push eastward from there to become the Plains Indians tribes. We dropped down further south into Central America to ultimately become the Olmecs, which became the Aztecs, or further dropped south into south into Central America to become the Mayas, and a further then colonization effort into South America to ultimately become the Incas, and even a further push even eastward to become the Amazon River tribes. All this colonization took about 40,000 years, covering 2,000 generations, 
at about a kilometer per year. And as you'll notice, we finally got into Northern Europe, really between 45 and 55,000 BC. There we met another species of a homo species called Neanderthal, sometimes pronounced Neanderthal. And he had been living there for hundreds of thousands of years and was the first hominid to live in cold environments and was specially suited for living in the cold type of environment at that time. Neanderthal's DNA is 99.7 the same as ours. They are the same, they're just a subspecies of us. However, they were physically different from us in that they were about five foot four. They were heavily muscled, they had larger bones than us, and they had a muscled physique. And they also had, uh, they were shorter, they were stockier, they had a large, they had wide shoulders and a wide rib cage, and the rib cage was conical. They were more mesomorph type than we as sapiens being ectomorph type. The reasons why they got this kind of weight physically was this was because of an adaptation to the cold and that they followed Bergman's Allen's rules, which says in a very cold climate, the surface area of the body will be reduced to conserve heat and that the body mass will increase in a colder environment. Simply put, Neanderthal's fingers, arms, legs, and body itself became shortened, but they became wider in the center to act as like a furnace to keep them warmer. This is why they were physically different than us. And of course, they have this bad boy reputation of being animalistic and brutalistic, and no, your brother-in-law is not a Neanderthal. <laughs> Everybody likes talking about them, so we're going to spend some time. Their skull is here to the right, and ours is to the left. <coughs> <Excuse me. coughs> Neanderthal had a uh, larger brain than we did, up to 1,600 cubic centimeters. And we think, uh, this is 25% more than ours, and we think this larger brain was for controlling extra motor senses that they would need in a colder climate. <coughs> they also had a, a more elongated skull, and more of a swept back forehead <coughs> than ours. Ours is being vertical and you can feel it yourself. They had a prominent brow ridge left over from their simian past, and they had larger eye sockets. The larger eyes were for seeing in the for seeing in more north, seeing better in more northern latitudes because there's less light in more northern latitudes, and they would need that. Therefore, that required more brain processing power for those images explaining more of their larger brain. With this kind of eyesight, they could also hunt at night, by the way. They also had a larger nose than us. This larger nose was for humidifying air because there was less humidity in a cold environment. They had more robust teeth, but more of a recessed jaw than ours, where ours is more prominent. <coughs> the animal lived in small social groups and the harness fire and had that straight hair as we talked about. Some facts about them are Neanderthals lived to be about 30 years old. They were much like you and me. They, were, they played music, they were able to talk, but uh, they couldn't make some ball sounds the way their larynx was constructed. They had a more high-pitched nasal tone to their voice. They did make sophisticated tools like um, spears, axes, owls, and scrapers. They made tools out of animal bones and antlers, and their tools were more robust and hardier than ours. And they had a wonderful sense of empathy. And it all would often be caretakers to those who are who were deformed or, or in had be, and become sick. They also were the first to leave ornamentations on graves. And this was for either showing respect for the dead or uh, having some religious symbolism. Now Neanderthals and us, sapiens, did meet together about 50,000 50, BC and lived together for thousands of years. Of course, the two species made it, and Neanderthal genome has been sequenced, and we each have between 1 to 3 percent Neanderthal genes inside of us. However, that's a very small gene pool, and it should be taken into note that, that that's small, because we have some influence traits from them in a small way. Some influence traits from Neanderthals are type 2 diabetes, the way they metabolize fat, Crohn's disease, which is a bowel disease, and uh, urinary tract infections that we'll talk about in a bit. Neanderthals have a tremendous diet. They needed 5,000 calories a day. Uh, 
mainly about five and six pounds of meat a day. Their diet was 80% meat and 20% vegetables. And generally thought of that over time, we the sapiens, well, we outwitted them and outcompeted for resources with them, which is why Neanderthal died out between 28,000 BC and 32,000 BC, their last stronghold being on Gibraltar. There's at least 20 other theories as to why Neanderthal died out. And I'll throw some at you briefly. First is that there's about 70,000 Neanderthals when we first met them in Northern Europe around 50,000 BC. However, they were outnumbered nine to one by the time of their demise. And this is because we think Neanderthals had a 40% less successful reproductive rate than we did. And we think this is because of Neanderthals and their tract infections, which didn't make anything work. There also is another theory that the last ice age, their forests that they hunted in were decimated. This left tundra, and Neanderthals were ambush hunters, and they lost some hunting techniques, which means they couldn't bring them back much as much food. Also, during lean times and drought times, Neanderthal would, well, they, they have a harder time surviving than we would because they needed all these calories. Also, Neanderthals tended to live in the low-lying areas, hence their name, Valley of the Neander, while we took higher ground, which means we were able to plan our hunts better and be more successful. Also, Neanderthal children grew up very quickly, which means they may not have gotten enough experiential information from their parents or clan leaders. Also, when Neanderthal women carry Neanderthal father children, they often miscarry, probably because of the size of the brain. And they also had shorter Achilles attendance than we did, which means they couldn't run as fast. And lastly, social anthropologists like to point out that they lived in these small social groups, so they lacked a shared sense of common identity, or uh, they lacked some social linking skills. Taking all this into account, this is why Neanderthals died out about 30,000 BC, but they were a fascinating species. Now, we get a lot of traits from our ancient ancestors, and one of them is not to be cartoonish. Uh, some, some of the traits and customs that we get from our ancient ancestors is when we shake hands, everybody knows to show we have no weapons. When we nod our head, yes, we, mean, and, uh, we accept the linear human figure, no means we deny it. And we are excellent as a species, or actually superior as a species, in recognizing and making and finding patterns. Patterns help us distinguish between friend and foe, which stimulates our fight and flight response that helps us survive. We see patterns in the way the nighttime sky, sky constellations were envisioned and the way we plant and harvest crops. While even the campfire evolved over time, the campfire, an obvious source of warmth, protection, and social togetherness, this evolved into the fireplace, which evolved into the modern-day kitchen. The kitchen is the heart and soul of every house, a place where we spend the most money to fix our house, and talking about kitchens has become an obsessive-compulsive disorder for all real estate agents. <laughs> <laughs> now, we also get a lot of, because 98.5% of our DNA is the same as chimps, we get a lot of traits from chimps. Of course, one of them is to wear shirts and ties, and the other one is to have messy desks. But we get some of these traits, but it's more fun if I show you, so I will. Chimps groom each other for social togetherness and, and calming reasons. We groom each other too. Everybody here has a hairdresser or a barber. A man who's about to be married is called a groom because he grooms the bride. Chimps tend to live in tribes, and so do we. A tribe can be a neighborhood, town, city, state, country, not even a social club. And in the villages, we even have Tribes within tribes, you can belong to a cycling tribe, and you can even idolize tribes. Okay. Chimps also fear snakes or phobia, and we dislike reptiles too. If I was to let a snake loose in this room, all pandemonium would break loose. And a snake is a source of evil and ill will in most religions around the world. Chimps fear strangers, xenophobia, and so do we. When a stranger comes into a group, they upset the social hierarchy and cause stress. This is where we get stranger danger from. Also, chimps commit murder, and animals that are very territorial and social commit murder. To name a few who do are elephants, bears, lions, dolphins, even crows commit murder. However, humans take murder to an unprecedented level, and we are the only species that can kill at a distance, rendering murder easy and impersonal. Chimps sleep in trees at night. 
this protects them against creepy predators down low. They get less insect bites in trees. And being up in the chimp low means you're dominant. That's positive. And up in our language is very positive. Like, I'm up for that. Everybody wants to climb up the social ladder. People want to be in the upper class. You want to have a higher education. Thumbs up. There's also thumbs up. And in most religions around the world, including the ancient Greek and ancient Egyptian, heaven is considered up. But the exact opposite of true is down. In the chimp world, when you're down, you are vulnerable, at risk, and exposed, and submissive. This is negative, and our language down is excessively a negative, like, that's down and dirty. How low can you go? That's beneath you to talk about. That's bottom of the barrel. Don't talk down to me. My blood pressure just was 20 points just talking that way. Uh, and there's also thumbs down, and in most religions around the world, hell is considered God. The same is true for light and dark. When it's light out, chicks are diurnal, and so are we. So when it's light outside, they can prepare and plan for things. And light is very positive, and light's positive in our language, like enlightening. Show me the light. You light up my life. Uh, most cars are light colored. Most houses are light colored. Most pets are light colored. The bride wears white to a wedding. And in almost all cultures around the world, light and white is a symbol of virtue and goodness. The exact opposite of true is dark. In the chimp world, when it's dark outside, stealthy predators can come out and can kill them. Dark is negative, they can't plan and prepare for anything. Dark is negative in our language, like the dark of the sturdy stranger. He was in a dark mood. Dark is always associated with something sinister, and I'll prove it to you right now. Just try imagining an outlaw motorcycle gang wearing all white outfits. <laughs> it just doesn't happen. Imagine going to a bar and ordering milk. I eat a yay. So we don't get the words from chimps, we get the connotations, they stay with us. These are the traits that make a modern human, like feudalism, walking upright, ability to speak words, a well-developed brain, use of sophisticated words. This all, yeah, this all then comes out to be us, homo sapien, that has been around for at least 300,000 years, and our brain then increased to this, which is 1,350 cubic centimeters, or three pounds. That means in two and a half million years, our brains increased two and a third pounds, or 37 ounces. And because of this, we had a number of revolutions. And one of them was language. Language developed 100,000 years in Africa, below in Africa, because those were the most fond of means or distinct units of sound were found. Language started out as clicks and whistles because those sounds do not carry very far when you're hunting. They're high pitch sounds. Also, the clicks and whistles system is still used by the Bushman tribe in Africa today. These women are whistling this right now. They're whistling this because they just got their cable bill and can't believe all those additional charges on it. <laughs> Another revolution was in tool making. The pace of tool making with us exceptionally increased. One of the tools never talked about is the ancient bone needle, which is able to sew animal skins together to make clothes for us to live in colder environments and to make protective huts. This helps us again from dying from exposure. Another revolution was in art, where our creative side of our brain really developed with the cave paintings 40,000 years ago in France, and everybody knows this. So, 150,000 years ago, we became anatomically human. 50,000 years ago, we became behavioral human. 11,000 years ago, agriculture started. 5,500 years ago, writing was developed. And 3,500 years ago, the wheel was invented. Now, today, we live in the Anthropocene era, or the age of man. We now control this planet's destiny and future. We are the only species to do so. We live on the planet's sixth grade extinction right now. In the past, these extinctions have become because of, of volcanic eruptions or cataclysmic events like meteor strikes. But this extinction is on us. In the last 100 years, we have lost half the planet's species of plants and half the, species, half the planet's species of animals. Since I've been talking to you, we have lost 900 acres of rainforest. We used to have, three trillion, we used to have six trillion trees. Now we have three trillion trees on Earth. Now, all these species that we have been talking about today, lastly, all these species, 
they've been around, all, all, go all the way back to Artie, back four and a half million years ago, when Artie first started walking upright, a hallmark of being called the homily. That comes down to 39 billion hours ago. One billion hours is 114,000 years. Now, the whole world, I'm talking about the whole world, watches YouTube at the rate of one billion hours a day. Therefore, within 39 days time, or less than six weeks, the whole world watches enough YouTube to eclipse the amount of time all of these hominid species have been on Earth. The whole world also plays video game, oh, the whole world also watches YouTube at this rate, and within, within, therefore within 20 months, the whole world watches enough YouTube to eclipse the amount of time going backwards to when the dinosaurs were roaming the Earth. The whole world also plays video games at, five, at the rate of five billion hours a month. Therefore, within eight months, the whole world plays enough video games in terms of time to eclipse the amount of time all these species here we've been talking about today. So you call that positive evolution or de-evolution the balls in your court. <laughs> As to the future of mankind, well, that's easy. It'll look something like this, where our artificial intelligence will be doing many of our jobs and our consciousness will be uploaded on a computer. And since my consciousness is about to expire, that is the end of my presentation, and thank you very much. <laughs>